Uh, good evening. My name is Bill Rivers. I'm chair of the English department here at the University of South Carolina. I'm here to welcome you to the third <clears throat> and last reading in this 10th iteration of the University of South Carolina's Fall Festival of Authors. I also have the honor of introducing our author for this evening. Um, before I get to the introduction, I want to make several announcements. First, I just want to remind you that there are copies of Kwame's books, uh, as you saw as you came in at the, in the, the vestibule behind the uh, auditorium, and Kwame has agreed to, uh, to sign copies that you, that you have. The second thing I want you to want to ask you is to do a very polite thing, and that is to, to reach into your bag or your holster or wherever you keep your cell phone and turn it off or shift it over to the etiquette mode. I just did mine a few minutes ago, I hope. Uh, thirdly, I want to call your attention to the cards that you will see <clears throat> beside every seat. Um, we're asking you to fill this out. It'll give us information that will help us get uh, information out about the Fall Festival more effectively next year. So if you would please fill them out and give them to me or to Elizabeth Suddeth or somebody else who's at the back of the room and who's probably be holding a stack of these cards. So if you do that, we would appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, I'd also like to just have uh, give a, a special word of thanks to Elizabeth Suddeth and Tom McNally of Thomas Cooper Library and also Elise Blackwell of the English Department. They, they've worked very hard. They've put a lot of time in, in careful planning and, and coordination to make the Fall Festival work this year, and we appreciate their efforts. And finally, I want to call your attention to the, uh, to the fact that the Fall Festival Authors has been made possible for 10 years now by a generous gift from an anonymous donor a person who both loves the University of South Carolina and who appreciates literary endeavors of all kinds. I think we as, as members of the Carolina community owe her a special debt of gratitude for a very special literary experiences that her gift has, has brought and will continue to bring for us, to us all for many years. And this, <clears throat> this evening's author will, I'm sure, continue that tradition of bringing a special literary experience. As you know, our speaker this evening is, is Kwame Dawes. He is a distinguished poet in residence at the, in the Department of English here at the university. Um, and I'm now going to do what you, I guess, have grown to expect in introductions to this kind. We'll give you a list of things that, that Kwame has, has accomplished. I'm, I'm not going to list everything. It's not going to be inclusive, but I think you'll find it's, it's impressive nevertheless. Kwame is the founder and director of the USC Poetry Initiative and the executive director of USC's Arts Institute, in addition to being a faculty member in English. Uh, Kwame is the author of at least 13, and I'm still trying to figure out if I missed one, it's probably 14 or 15 by now, books of poetry. And based on that poetry, he has received the Forward Poetry Prize, the Hollis Summers Poetry Prize, a Pushcart Prize, and the Poetry Business Award. He's also written and published three works of fiction, including two novels and one collection of short stories. He's published one play, and I also know that he's written a number of others that uh, are working their way into print at the behest of a publisher. So there's, there's more to come in, in that genre. He's also recently published a memoir. Uh, he's also uh, done a collection of interview, interviews with Caribbean poets, and he's done a book-length critical assessment of Bob Marley, and it, that book is now in its uh, second edition. And I'm going to take just a moment for a personal aside here. I was in, to Kwame, really, I was in China back in September, and I actually saw a young Chinese guy with a Bob Marley t-shirt on. So I just want to let you know, you're probably going to be on the, on the lecture circuit in China soon, as Bob Marley's fame spreads, yours will as well, I think. Uh, Kwame is also a musician wonderful singer who has worked with other musicians, uh, both singers and instrumentalists, to create several wonderful programs based on his, centered around his poetry. And then most recently, Kwame has turned his talents to the production of a multimedia website called Hope Living and Loving with HIV in Jamaica. Sponsored by the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, this website pairs his poetry with music, essays, and video testimonies from people living with AIDS, and also people caring for those with AIDS in, in Jamaica. <clears throat> and as you probably already know, the television documentary, documentary 
uh, based on this website and Kwame's work in Jamaica, just a few weeks ago won an Emmy Award from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. So Kwame's been a very busy man uh, and a very busy and very successful poet. I want to end my, my introduction by commenting just very briefly on one group of Kwame's poems. I think all of his work is very, very good. Uh, however, the poems in this category are the ones that move me and that stay with me more than the others. Uh, I have my own name for this group of poems. I call them the life-saving poems. Uh, when I say life-saving, I'm not thinking of Kwame rescuing people from mortal danger as if he were kind of a literary lifeguard, you know, patrolling the, the beach of life and running around pulling people out of the water. Well, it's uh, an image that I, I think is fun and, and in some ways quite appropriate. Uh, when I say life-saving, I'm thinking of how so much of his poetry, especially the ones that appeal to me, uh, capture the lives, the thoughts, the passions, the loves, and the values of very special real people. And he saves those people for us and for readers and generations to come. I think it's a very good thing to do, and it makes for very powerful poetry, in my, in my opinion. It also, I think, takes a very special kind of poet. It takes a poet that's not just able to put words and phrases and sentences together to achieve a powerful effect. It also takes a poet and a person who is willing to, to listen with care and sensitivity to what these people tell him about their lives. Uh, that ability to listen, I would argue, is as much a gift as the ability to craft words in the poems, and, and Kwame has both those gifts, I think. The, uh, the life-saving poetry can be seen in Wisteria, which I'm sure you're, or most of you probably know about, is a, a collection of poems based on interviews with a number of Afri elderly African-American uh, people from Sumter County, South Carolina. It can be seen in another modest little volume of poetry called Grace, poems honoring Columbia and Richland County's African-American leaders. These poems are, I think, a special gift to a special group of people in our community. And, and again, it's saved their, saving their lives for, for posterity to, 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 to know and learn about. Some of the most powerful of his life-saving poems, however, are in this, this last special activity, this hope living and loving with HIV in Jamaica. And even if, even if Kwame reads from these poems this evening, and I, I hope he does, I'd encourage you to go to the website and see for yourselves what I'm talking about. And I'll be very specific. I'll suggest one poem. I recommend you go read Coffee Break. Uh, read the poem, or you'll hear, you'll be able to read it and hear Kwame uh, present it, read it himself. Then go to the interview with John Merzuka and listen to him talk about one of his patients, a guy he was uh, caring for, and the coffee they were to share one Christmas day. It's a, that's the story that inspired Kwame's poem, Coffee Break. If you do, you'll see how carefully Kwame listened <clears throat> and how well he captured both Merzuka's story and his patient's story. But if you pay close attention, look back at the poem after you listen to Marizuka's comments or his, his, his story, you'll see how Kwame the poet, with a few deft touches, turned Marizuka's story into a truly memorable, moving, powerful poem. It's a beautiful contrast, and I hope you go look at it. So I'm looking forward to hearing Kwame read both from his life-saving poems and from the others as well. And if we're lucky, he might even sing a bit for us. So join me in welcoming Kwame Das. Thank you. Thanks, Bill, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, Tom and Elizabeth and all the people who are involved in this, Elise. And thank you all for being here. It's not guaranteed that anybody shows up. <laughs> it's just a reading after all. So I'm glad you're here. Um, I, just, I just came back from Jamaica yesterday. Uh, where I gave a lecture on my father's work uh, at the Institute of Jamaica, which is the Cultural Institute of Jamaica, in a wonderful, ornate hall um, that I had completely forgotten about. It's in downtown Kingston, where nobody really goes to, um, unless they, they want to get hurt. Um, and, but, but so many people showed up for that lecture, and um, it, 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 it reminded me of him and, and his 
his, the, the legacy he left me. Uh, so I, I will dedicate this reading to him. I'm going to take you on a journey through a series of poems and um, maybe a bit of prose, and we'll see where that takes us. I'll start with a poem called Progeny of Air, which is the title poem for my first collection of poems, which was published in 1994. The poem is really almost a found poem. I worked for the Canadian government uh, for a few years after I got my PhD. Uh, my job was to go around to all the training facilities for fish farmers in eastern Canada and report on the quality of the work, which took me to the fish farms and, and other places. Um, the, the intention was that I would spend six months going around and then write a report on my, my, my journeys around and, and so on. Um, but the, the peculiar and probably the great mistake that they made was that they supplied me with a, a computer uh, with, with a printer um, and, and a room that, with a door that closed. Um, uh, so what I did was I did the report you know, in two weeks and then pretended to be doing the report for the rest of the time while I wrote Progeny of Air and you know, visited other parts of New Brunswick that I hadn't seen in a while. So, um, so <laughs> But th there's a reason why I don't feel any guilt about that, but I, I won't get into that. It just has to do with immigration and, um, and that kind of thing. So I, I feel no way about that. Canada got a lot out of me, and I gave, I took what I could get. Um, so this is a poem called, I, I love Canada, by the way. <laughs> Progeny of air. The propellers undress the sea, the pattern of foam like a broken zip opening where the bow cuts the wave and closing in its wake. The seals bark, gulls call and dive, then soar loaded with catch. The smell of rotting salmon lingers over the Bay of Fundy like a mortuary's disinfected air. Fish farms litter the coastline, metal islands cultivating with scientific precision these gray back, pink fleshed fish. In the old days, salmon would leap up the river to spawn, journeying against the current. They are travelers. When tucked too low, searching for undertoes to rest upon, they often scrape their bellies on the sharp atzi and bleed. Now watch them turn and turn in the cages, waiting for the feed of colorized heron to spit from the silver computer bins over the islands of sea farms. And General, the hugest of the salmon, has a square nose where a seal chewed on a super freeze night. When her blood panicked and almost froze, Jean-Pierre, the technician and sea cage guard, thinks they should roast the general in onions and fresh salt water. It is hard to read mercy in his stare and matter-of-factly way. He wears layers, fisherman's uniform, passed from generation to generation, the plaid shirt, the stained yellow jacket, the ripped olive green boots, the black slack trousers with holes, the whiskers and eye of sparkle as if salt sea has crystallized on his sharp cornea. He guides the boat in, spills out after our visit with a grunt and a grin, willing us to wet our sneakers on the water's edge. The sun blazes through the chill, the motor stutters, the sea parts, and then zips shut and still. Stunned by their own intake of poison, the salmon turn belly up on the surface, then sucked up by the plastic piscillator, they plop limp and gasping in the sunlight. One by one, the glove technicians press with their thumbs the underside of the fish, spilling the eggs into tiny cups destined for the hatchery. Anesthetized eyes glazed shock on the steel deck. They know the males from the females, always keep them apart, never let seed touch egg, never let the wind carry the smell of birth through the June air. On burden now, the fish are flung back in. They twitch then, tentative as hungover denizens of nightmares. They swim the old Sisyphean pattern of their tiny cosmos. The fish try to spawn at night, but only fart bubbles and herring. On the beach, the rank saltiness of murdered salmon is thick in the air. Brown seaweed sucks up the blood. The beach is a construction site of huge cement blocks which moor the sea cages when tossed 80 feet down. They sink into the muddy floor of the bay and stick. 
There is no way out of this prison for the salmon. They spin and spin in the algae green netting, perpetually caught in limbo, waiting for years before being drawn up and slaughtered, staked and stewed. And in the morning silence, the sun is turning over for a last dose. And silver startles the placid ocean against the gray green of Deer Island. A salmon leaps in a magical arc, slaps the metal walkway in a bounce, and then dives, cutting the chilled water on the other side. Swimming, swimming is general. This is my fantasy. With the square nose and skin gone pink with seal bites, escaping from this wall of nets and weed, general swims up river alone, leaping the current with her empty womb, leaping, still instinct, still trapped traveling to the edge of Lake Utopia where, after so many journeyings, after abandoning this secure world of spawning and living at the delicate hands of technicians, after denying herself social security and the predictability of a steady feeding and the safety from predator seal and osprey, after enacting that Sisyphean orbit of all fish here in the shadow of the Connor's sardine factory, she spawns her progeny of air and dies. <clears throat> I still eat salmon. Yeah. Very good fish. Well, <laughs> I just needed you to know that. You should eat salmon. It's OK. Um, this is a poem for my daughter, Senna, on her birth. It's called Aquaba which in Ghana means welcome. One, brown snow lines the roadways, the still gray city of whispers in the sunrise inches into bloom. I see your slick wet head swaddled in a sheet of blood, your mother breathing into the half light, Senna wailing across my heart. Two, Lorna stares at the television, not recording the flicker of lights, just willing love to flow slow in warm streams of her milk into your quick-sucked mouth, locked on like a fish in passion. Three, picture this, my heart solace. Forever I will watch your eyes blaze through my dim, lensless blur. Forever sweet Senna, gift from God Almighty. Aquaba, Aquaba, Aquaba. <clears throat> um, I'll read a poem from a collection called Progeny of Air, which is a long, not Progeny of Air, Prophets, which is a long, uh, pretty much one long poem. Um, and tells a very interesting story um, about a church I, I, I attended in Jamaica. In fact, I was just there on Sunday. They've moved from where they used to be. But. And this is, this is where the church used to meet. So this is a poem simply called Sunday Morning. Bougainvillea spills its tongues of yellow and speckled blood on the outdoor ballroom floor. And the steel drums rest, rust in the puddles from August rains. Here on the aqua tiles now fading, the water pools in the stinking foundations and dry upper ground is strewn with the goat shit where the goats shelter from the deluge. Bramble lies scattered like debris of sea carved wood on a fresh Friday beach. Here with the six o'clock morning cloud cover, the cool breeze licks the shack shack pods. Prayers turn heavenward in the makeshift chapel, sometimes gymnasium, where on weekdays sweating first years play their symphony of ping pong dropping like rain, soft sponge, plastic on wood, their souls squeaking on the slick floors. The folding glass windows are stained. The janitor says the water seeps into the double plate and stays preserved like that for years. In the yard behind the building strewn with bloated plastic chemical bottles, old film and stench of sulfur, cows graze in the gungu vines and mud 
penned in by the stripped coconut stems and bamboo, strangled by plaits of barbed wire. The soil is always soft, clay is splattered on the walls, beneath the dripping air conditioner, jutting its rusting mechanics into the elements. Through the glass, the avenue of pines sheds its yellow cones. Coolie plum trees drop a squishy, pungent carpet of fermenting yellow fruit and dizzy bees. The crooked trees, like starved acolytes, reach for the praise of song and raised hands. The campus is overrun by butterflies on Sunday mornings, and as the sermon flames its tongue of deliverance in the fanning flurry, flurry of the congregation for Christ, this is the distraction that swallows my wandering eye. Dreaming is easy in this dream window landscape, and if I stare long enough, pushing back the tambourines and tongues, the mutterings and grunts of possession and release, at the play of green, yellow, and ochre of the wild gungu vines, I sometimes come away like David from the wilderness of olives and eucalyptus green glowing from my indulgence. This romantic interim in the passion of gospel reverie is sometimes all there is to keep you rooted there in the clamor of your sins, your falling, your remorse. On Sundays, sometimes, they think I have died inside, on feeling to the prophecy coming like the wind, the bright red blood of Christ in the crystal decanter. When my eyes dance, the leap and dip of yellow butterflies turning around the cakes of green, fresh, fly-thick cow shit, the sky winks through the leaves. And in the precious glass bowl silence, caught in my own life-giving bubble of indulgence, the voice carries clear over water. I am saved again without a shot being fired. <clears throat> what I did in church, not you write poems in church. That's, that's, um, that's a, a helpful thing to do, depending on the quality of the sermons. Um, I'll read some poems from Midland. These, this poem is for Derek Walcott, uh, whose work I regard as an important influence, but it's also a poem for my father called Inheritance. And I'll read two sections. This is section five. If he is my father, there is something of that fraying dignity and the way genius is worn casual and urbane, aging with grace. He has not lost much over the years. The cigarette still stings his eyes and the scent of Old Spice distilled in Gordon's dry gin is familiar here by the sea where a jaunty shanty, the city of gulls and the squeak of the rigging of boats are a right backdrop. But I have abandoned the thought, the, the search for my father in this picture. He is not here, though I still come to the ritual death watch like a vulture around a crippled beast. The flies already bold around its liquid eyes, too resigned to blink. I have come for the books, the cured language, the names of this earth that he has invented, the stories of a town and the way he finds women's slippery parts in the smell and shape of this island, the making and unmaking of a city through the epic cataclysm of fire. Eating the brittle old wood, myths dancing in the thick smoke like the gray ashen debris of sacrifice, it is all here with him. This specimen living out his twilight days, prodigious as John's horror, the green uncertain in the half-light. When we meet, he is distant. He knows I want to draw him out, peer in for clues. He will not be drawn out. He is too weary now. He points his chin to the rum shop to an old man, Afolabi, sitting on the edge of a canoe, black as consuming night. I can tell that he carries a legend in his terrible soul each morning, a high tower over the sea. And six, I could claim him easily, 
Make of him a tale of nurture and benign neglect. He is alive, still speaks, his brain clicks with a routine revelation that can spawn in me the progeny of his mo monumental craft. These colonial old men, fed on cricket and the tortured indulgence of white schoolmasters patrolling the mimic island streets like gods growing gray and sage-like in the heat and stench of the third world, they return to the reactionary nostalgia during their last days. It is the manner of aging, we say, but so, so, so sad. I could adopt him, dream of blood, and assume his legacy of a divided self, but it would ring false quickly. After all, my father saw the Niger eating out a continent beginning its rapid descent to the Atlantic. He tasted the sweet of Kelewele of an Akan welcome and cried at the uncompromising flame of Akbeteshi. The blood of his sons was spilled like libation into the soil and more. In 1926, an old midwife buried his bloodied navel string and the afterbirth of his arrival at the foot of an ancient cotton tree there on the Delta Islands of Calabar. My blood defines the character of my verse. Still, I pilfer a much better word. Rummage through the poet's things to find the useful how he makes a parrot flame a line, or a cicada scream in wind. The names he gives the bright berries of an island in the vernacular of Adam and the tribe. And let me read a poem that does the transition for me from the Caribbean to South Carolina. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a transition. Um, there are many things that are the same and that connect, but there are many things that are quite different. But this is one of the poems that came out of the reflection of that. I was driving from Sumter to Columbia, and um, I was just thinking. I think I was listening to some music on the radio. There's a great tune called Sata Masagana, and it simply goes, there is a land far, far away, where there is night and there's no day. Look into the book of life and you will see that there's a land far, far away. I, Roy, by the way, you won't understand any of this. I'm just saying, so just enjoy it. <laughs> I, Roy, rides the rhythm where the saxman used to rest and the bass talking to the royal man who can turn rhyme into sacredness. Want to chant damnation where my enemies gawk at the tumbling and jam and ramming home a truth. Who, who, who can say concubine like tracing out the wicked spot to hell like I royal mouth shooting fire. So Sata Amasa Ghana says the prophet cool like a knife edge and then catch the cross stick tacking the rhythm. Sata 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 Amasa Ghana. I'm striding through an alien landscape. The road smooth, the air heavy with rain and my heart bluesing along when the prophet speaks and it's enough for the grooves of a 45 glimmering vinyl. The comfort of God again on me. Look into the book of life and you will see that there's a land far, far away. I told you, but it's, it's really, it makes sense though. It's really, it's really actually quite good. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I read one of my favorite poems to read. This is a poem for a woman in Sumter, South Carolina, called Rosie Richardson. It's a poem called Tornado Child. I met her, I put a mic in front of her, and I said, please, tell me your name. And she said, my name is Rosie Richardson, and I'm a tornado child. I said, really? And she says, yes. I was born in the middle of a tornado. And I thought, there's a poem. <laughs> and when she was done with me, I felt like I had been whipped through one hell of a tornado. So this is for Rosie Richardson. I'm a tornado child. I come like a swirl of black and darken up your day. I whip it all into my womb, lift you and your things, carry you to where you've never been, and maybe if I feel good, 
I might bring you back all warm and scared, heart humming wild like a bird after early sudden flight. See, I'm a tornado child. I tremble at the elements when thunder rolls my mother womb trembles remembering the tweak of contractions that tightened to a wail when my mother pushed me out into the black of a tornado night. I'm a tornado child. You can tell us from far by the crazy of our hair. Couldn't tame it if we tried. Even now I tie a bandana to silence the din of anarchy in these kaya thick plats. See, I'm a tornado child, born in the whirl of clouds. The center crumbled, then I came. My lovers know the blast of my chaotic given. They tremble at the whip of my supple thighs. Tornado child, you cross me at your peril. I cling to light. When the warm of anger lashes me into a spin, the pine trees bend to me, swept in my gyrations. See, I'm a tornado child. When the spirit takes my head, I hurtle into the vacuum of a white sheet billowing and paint a swirl of color streaked with my many, many songs. Because I'm a tornado child. That's old Rosie. Rosie also used to drink a bit, you know, so she was... <laughs> I don't think she's drinking anymore, though. But she's still fiery as ever. I saw her maybe a year or so ago, and she was taking bows for the book and all my awards. She was saying, that's me. That's all my stuff. He's just ripped me off, and so on. So she's still who she is. There's a poem for all the women who told me their stories about the siblings that they lost. All of them would remember the names of the stillborn children their stillborn children, and particularly those of their mothers. And many of them grew up at a time when that was so common and um, so painful. So this is called Stillborn. Take my baby home. Take my baby home. I ain't free and never will be. Take my baby home. Oh, glory. Oh, oh glory. There is room enough in paradise to have a home. I still count them, feeling them like ghost limbs. They have their place in my collection of years. Remembering them is a way to remember to count the pressure pills, the heart pills, the blood pills, the tyranny of pills. I count those who died before they walk, those I cradle, caress, cocoon to life, hoping beyond the weakness of their cries. They died too, leaving us with tough questions for God Almighty. Old black folk have buried so many babies in the bush behind the cotton groves with the naked form of cotton bales standing like sentinel crucifixes against the stale blue of summer skies. O oh, glory. O oh, glory, there is room enough in paradise to have a home. And mother gathers her body and the tears and builds new fires, cooks new meals, readies her womb to replenish its rooted self, to make more brothers, sisters like second nature. She carries her mourning deep in her skin, away to count the days. My mother bore nine children. We chant this as a litany of her strength. Three did not live to see the second year, and she did not live to see the first year of her wash belly, wash soul, wash body, the thin film of her drying birth water scraped off with a rough cloth as they laid her out to rest. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home. Skin. This skin, 
is leather black with time. This skin is tough like old rooster flesh. This skin won't give like poulet. You bite this skin, you're likely to eat crow. This skin has wailed its own symphony of blue-black sorrow, tough like this. This skin tasted the salt of crystals, licked them up and recorded the pain. This skin's been turned inside out, left to dry. This skin swallowed the blast of sun, collected the bite of January air, and still there, still there. This skin has smelled the acrid smoke of burning flesh, hanging there against the new day, sniffed it, felt its layering of old skin, soot carrying centuries of suffering. This skin is washed with flow of men menstrual blood, love juice, old semen, bitter spit, loose shit, every ugliness dumped into the earth, been through this skin. This is no tenderloin, prime cut skin. You bite me, you're likely to eat crow. This skin is a walking museum. When you see me coming, read me. When you see me coming, read me. One day, I will come to the river, and oh, love will touch this skin. And I will rise, ebony glow and tender, crossing that river to the other side. <clears throat> I think I'll read a poem for Bob Marley. How about that? That's a good idea. Yeah. They came with bulldozers and steel horses to build a playpen for the wealthy. They want to swing golf clubs over my father's grave. Can they leave me with this little bit of history? Can they leave me with this little bit of heritage? Well, I killed a cowboy today, you know. I thought they were dead, you know, that old generation of pale faces with their trinkets and their guns and their forked tongues. Well, I know down there in Oka, I shot one of them boys today. See, I killed a cowboy today. I shot John Wayne. I didn't mean it. My old man brought me here, I remember, stuck his hand in the soil, wounding it, rolled the dirt in his fingers with a little spit. He said, good clay must have the ancestor's bones, boy. Good clay must have the warrior's bones. So I killed the cowboy today. I thought they were dead, you know, that old generation of pale faces with their trinkets and their guns and their forked tongues. But I know, down there in Oka, I shot one of them boys today. See, I killed the cowboy today. I shot John Wayne. I didn't mean it. We danced. All night in the full yellow moon. My old man, he howled with tears in his eyes. He called the trees, leaves, blades of grass, sacred. He stood as if roots grew from his feet like roots clinging tight to the toil, soil. So I killed a cowboy today. I thought they were dead, you know, that old generation of pale faces with their trinkets and their guns and their forked tongues. But I know down there in Oka, I shot one of them boys today. I killed a cowboy today. I shot John Wayne. I didn't mean it. But what is this world coming to? What is this world coming to when a bullet seemed like the only answer, when a gunshot is the only thing that will make them listen? I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. <clears throat> Tell him it's a good reading. <laughs> Um, you know, Bob Marley was married to Rita Marley, right? You all know that because you, you guys are on top of the Bob Marley story, right? But um, it was a very troubled marriage. And um, in it, there's a kind of iconic story about how sometimes marriages can be very complicated. So I wrote a poem for Rita Marley called Rita. Um, Bob got around. Uh, you'll get that from the poem. Um, so, this is it, Rita. 
I first saw you cooking in, a back, in the background of a jumpy camera shot while the dread held forth constructing his facade of enigma, dodging the barbs and darts of Babylon with code, and three times he denied you, called you a sister like Isaac did to Rebecca, leaving her there hanging like that open season for Ahimelech and the boys. And that is what you were, a flower tarnished, just a helping sister, Martha in the kitchen swollen with child, and who, watching this, would have known of the nights he would crawl into your carbolic womb to become the man-child again, searching for a father who rode off on his white steed and never returned, never sent a message. For years I thought you had lied, for it was, your, it was our way to believe the patriarch, and who would want to declare the coupling of a downtown dread with the uptown Miss World too sweetly ironic, too much of Hollywood on this sun-dredged, dust-beaten city? Who would let your black face, weighed by the insult, disturb our reverie? I did not believe the rumors, so while the nation grumbled and cussed you out and declared you gold digger and such the like, when he was buried and celebrated in death, and you published the wedding photos, the family snapshots of another time, when you battled like a higgler for rights and played every dubious game in the book, rough house, slander, ratchet smile and all, I called it poetic, the justice you received, for you played the cards right. No bad care drawn in your hands as you sat quietly in the back room like a nun, bride of Christ, and slave to mission. And when you knew other men before the tears could dry from our eyes and made another child in your fertile womb when your garments of silence were replaced with the garish gold and silver of decadence. When you entered the studio to play rude girl, naughty as hell, talking about feeling damn high and rolling your backside like a teenager, I had to smile at the poor meaning of it all for you fasted before the feast you played the wife of noble character eating the bitter fruit of envy while the dread sought out the light-skinned beauties from london to la king solomon multiplying himself among the concubines these days I have found a lesson of patience in your clever ways, a picture of fortitude despite the tears. You are Jamaican woman with the pragmatic walk of a higgler off, oh, offering an open bed for his mind-weary nights, an air for his whispered fears and trepidations, and a bag of sand for a body to be beaten, slapped up, and kicked and abused. You took it all like a loan to be paid in full at the right time. I no longer blame you for the rabid battles raging over the uneasy grave of the Rigan. In dread for now I know how little we know of those salad days in St. Anne one room shack where you made love like a stirring pot and watched the stars for they were the only light what potions you must have made to tie, tie, tie your souls together like this. I simply watch your poetic flight, black sister, reaping fruit for the mother left abandoned with a fair-skinned child, for the slave woman who caressed the head of some married white master with hopes of finding favor when the days were ripe, all who sucked salt and bitter herbs, all who scratched dust, scavenged for love, all who drew bad cards. You've walked the walk well. The pattern is an old one. I know it now. It's your time now, daughter. Ride on. Ride on, Natty Dread. Ride on, my sister. Ride on. That's for Rita. I'll read a few more poems, and then I want to read a little passage from um, a short story. Let me read um, a few poems from Hope's Hospice, which was mentioned. I can find it. I think I'll just read Coffee Break since, since Bill mentioned that. Um, this, is, this is a poem for, J for John Mazuka who told me this story. And, and Bill is right, he told me the story and I, I, it just haunted me for days and days until I could put it into a poem. Or it was a poem, but I just shaped it into this. John was telling me, John ran this place called Hope's Hospice, which is an indigent home for the dying. And before antiretroviral drugs reached Jamaica, that was the place in Montego Bay where many of the people in that area came to die who may have had AIDS. And I asked him, were there any individuals who were memorable to you that affected you and that bothered you? or stayed with you. 
and he told me this story. So this is in John's voice. Coffee break. It was Christmas time. The balloons needed blowing. And so in the evening, we sat together to blow balloons and tell jokes. And the cool air of the hills made me think of coffee. So I said, coffee would be nice. And he said, yes, coffee would be nice. And smiled as his thin fingers pulled the balloons from the plastic bags. So I went for coffee. And it takes some few minutes to make the coffee. And I did not know if he wanted cow's milk or condensed milk. And when I came out to ask him, he was gone. Just like that. In the time it took me to think, cow's milk or condensed, the balloons sat lightly in his still lap. This is a poem called A Vanity. And it's, it's a, once you enter this world and you start to be amongst people and to interview them and so on, it is inevitable that you're going to imagine what it would be if you had the disease. And it's something funny came to me that one of, one of some of the people had said to me. <laughs> Um, and it led me to this poem um, called A Vanity. And the epigraph is from um, Shakespeare. And the line is, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh should melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew. I promise myself simple things, like to fight to the death for my vanity. To always chase after the damned wind. For to live fully immersed in one's vanity is surely to live. So, I promise that Rachel Eliza will bring her satchel of cameras and film and drive me to an open field between two mountains near a cottage with its sky blue walls when I have reached perfection, when I have been sculpted down to 186 pounds and my hair has been trimmed to a dark gleam over my skull, and the veins in my arms are coiled beautifully over the last breath of muscle before my bones take over. For two weeks of elegance, I will gamble and cavort shirtless and lewd, offer my flat-bellied profile, revealing at last the ribs I lost so long ago. And my navel will be a tight knot jutting slightly after being so long in the dark well of my stomach. And in that sweet interim, I will be as beautiful as I have dreamed to be. And everyone will adore the shape of my splendid emaciation. All this before the joints bore against my worn out skin. Before I join the boneyard of the walking dead. It is the one promise I make to myself. And it must happen in May, when the poey trees begin to be yellow and blue, and the world is in glorious riot. And in that moment, everything will be right with me, I promise. It's a poem called Faith. And this poem is dedicated to a support group in a small, well, it's not a small town. It's actually a huge bedroom community called Portmore, where almost a million people live. It's a rough area. Uh, but it's a place close to my heart because that's where my wife used to live. And I used to go, when I was a student, I would go and visit her and get stuck there because there's no bus out. And then I would have to walk miles back, things you do for love. And... Um, but this is for the people who I met there. It's called faith. You know that scripture in Hebrew, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, the seen things. The news comes like a stone falling, suddenly all light is gone. Outside the heat is black as loss. 
Tomorrow is a burden. I speak the words into the air, no one answers. The sky is a dull plate of silences. Tomorrow is a heavy load. My feet move sluggishly, every sound muted to a drone. It is hard to dream these days, and oh, the tears, the tears, the seen thing. This treachery of the blood is a secret rushing through me, and my face is a mask. No one must read beyond its inscrutable dumbness. No one must know. I cannot read the faces around me. Everyone seems filled with hope. How pleasantly ordinary this life must be for them, I think. But who can read the secrets we carry in this city of dust, exhaust, and the clamor of engines? the unseen things. Hope is in the tender hands that hold you. Hope is in the embrace of the loving. Hope is in the flesh, touching flesh to remind us of our human selves. Hope is in the gentle nod of recognition. Hope is in the limping body still pushing against the pain, the discomfort still laughing from so deep down it feels like the rush of alcohol in the head, the full abandonment of all fear. Hope is the freedom to say, I long to feel the rush of desire satisfied. Hope is to embrace hunger and find comfort in the sharing of needs. Hope is in the hands we grasp, the prayers we whisper, the amens, the amen, the amen. Evidence and substance. There is substance in the gathering of bodies battered by this disease. There is evidence in the quiet promises we make to be here again next week. There is substance in the sweet taste of coconut water, the scent of morning. There is evidence in the songs a slim man sings, healing as the balm of warmed oil. There is substance in the expletive, shattering our peace, the tears, the laments, the fear. There is evidence in the hum of recognition, the comfort of hands held tightly. There is substance in the streets walk to tell people to hope for tomorrow. There is evidence in the body growing fat with love, round with hopefulness. There is substance in the promises we make to protect this world with the truth of our wounds. There is evidence in the rituals of the living, the memories of the lived, the calm we crave. There is substance in the green of rainy season, in the harvest of sweet mangoes in November. There is evidence in these songs we now sing against the treachery of our blood. One more poem, and then I'll read a short passage from She's Gone, and then I'll be done, and we can talk. Okay? Is that good? All right, great. Rainbow Over Hope Road. This is a poem that really was given to me on the last day of my interviews and so on in Jamaica. Uh, we were driving back up from, this, from the coast. Kingston is, is actually a coastal town, but we were driving up towards the hill um, to where I was going to be, where I was staying. Um, and the Blue Mountains stand just really magnificently over the, the, the coast, and they rise beautifully. And they are blue and purple and glorious. And all of a sudden, there was this startling rainbow, and it was the most perfect rainbow I've ever seen. And in the little van that we were in, there were all kinds of people who um, had, was living with the disease and so on and so forth. But we all stared at this sun, this, this wonderful burst of a rainbow, and, and it just seemed right. So this is the poem, Rainbow Over Hope Road. And for just that instance, when from Hope Road, we watched the rainbow cut across the robust body of the Blue Mountains, the way the sun seemed filtered and clean as peace, when the gleam of quick color bounced giddily over the cars, we offered quiet gratitude for fleeting, lasting things. I thought I'd read just one short passage from um, my novel, She's Gone, um, to round things off. And it's, it's a little funny, hopefully. Um, and, and then I'll be done, so it'll be a short passage. Um, and just to set this up, uh, Keisha is 
a woman from South Carolina, and she meets a Jamaican guy called Kofi. And um, Kofi eventually convinces her to come to Jamaica, to go, you know, to go to Jamaica. And um, she, for some odd reason, decides to go. Uh, when they get there, they are staying in a in a in a house, and Kofi doesn't seem to work, but he he still is able to feed them for some reason. He's still able to get food and so on. But she eventually gets a little job teaching. Then one day he comes and says you know, get in the car, we're going to see my aunt. And she says, you have relatives here? And she sa he says, yes, because he has never introduced her to anybody. Um, and so this is the first meeting between Kofi and his, um, to Keisha and, and, and Kofi's aunt. Um, so I'll, I'll just read the passage. They've gone into, this, into the hills and they see this magnificent building, this, this colonial mansion. And... Um, and she's very surprised by this because she now realizes this guy comes from money. <laughs> and then as they walk towards the mansion, they hear martial music like, you know, Sousa. It's just really loud. And so they walk into the house and the music is just blaring. Because of the glare, Keisha did not immediately see the small hand poking above the back of a chair that faced out to the window, but she saw the hand raised open and she knew to wait while the music moved toward a finale. Keisha studied the hand, small, old, draped in white, flim filmy material. There were two rings. One was thick, a thick band and the other had a stone, both on her marriage finger. The horns exploded in the final march and then stepped out with the drums accented by clashing cymbals. Crashing cymbals completed the march. Keisha could not help picturing a drum major tossing his baton into the sky. Silence followed. The band stayed, the hand stayed raised for a few more seconds and then slowly came down. Turn it off now, Mary! A shrill voice erupted from behind the chair. The drum roll of another song started and was then sharply aborted. Thank you, love. Keisha was afraid of this woman. My guests, the voice said. It was a command. Kofi shook his head and went forward. Keisha followed. She could have been white. Her skin was a pale yellowish color with blotches of tender light brown on her hands and her chest and her face. Her veins were a dull bluish green and they crawled across her forehead along the scaffolding of bones in her neck and in a thin streaks along her arms. Her eyes were a pale gray, small eyes behind gold rimmed glasses that sat on the broad bridge of her nose. She could have been white except that apart from skin color, she was black. There was something almost albino about her. Her full pulpy lips seemed to have been stolen from a woman 40 years her junior and her nose flared wide and dramatic like Kofi's. Keisha stared at this woman with some intensity that was not so polite. Kofi's aunt was a small, thin woman. She sat small. Her legs were crossed under her light cotton dress, which was cut low with tassels and a series of pleats where the bosom would have been. She wore a pearl necklace. She looked hard at Keisha without any self-consciousness, looked her up and down so that Keisha felt exposed, aware of her naked legs, the hair that had grown there since she had last shaved, the sloppiness of her casual leather sandals. Sit, 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 Kofi's aunt said, pointing to the sofa in front of her. Kofi he faced her, leaned down, kissed her on the lips, and she opened her palm tenderly on Kofi's face, letting it take the contour of his cheek. I thought you stopped listening to that music. Lara said it making the cow and milk sour. Kofi was laughing as he sat beside Keisha. I told Lara to stop troubling those cows, and the milk would be fine, she said. But you know these country people, old habits die hard. Anyway, his wife left him. You are scandalous. Why you have to say that about Laro? Kofi asked. Say what? I'm not condemning anyone. There's nothing morally wrong with doing that kind of thing with cows. At least I didn't think so. But it must affect the cow's milk production. After all, they are used to, well, larger things. Can we change the subject? This is Keisha. My nephew is a prude, you know. Don't be fooled by all his sweet talk. He's a prude. He was going to be a minister, said he had a revelation from the hills. Did he tell you? I suppose he didn't tell you that he used to come here with a Bible to convert me to the Holy Ghost. He was only 15 then. Now, my husband, the second, he always said that Kofi wanted, waited too long 
to clear his, well, his maiden deposit. Hmm, I like that. Thank God he did not turn to the cows, though. At least I don't think he did. Did you, Kofi? Look, don't be ridiculous, Kofi said quickly. Keisha could not help laughing. No, he did not tell me any of this. Ah, secret, secrets, lovely. The old woman smiled brightly at Keisha. She had white space teeth, but those Keisha saw looked yellow enough to be original. Mary? Mary, put the record back on and turn it low, no? And Josephine, please, Kofi said, just be quiet, boy. The music reminds me of Umberto. I like to remember Umberto. Keisha, she asked, raising her eyebrows. Yes, Keisha. Hmm, very black name. Black American, that is. We don't have many Keishas here, you know. I hear you have many in America. You know where it came from? No, no ma'am. Keisha found herself reverting to her southern politeness. Kofi looked at her oddly. No, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Aunt Josephine spoke almost to herself. Well, Keisha, my husband Umberto was my second husband, really. And when I had worked my first one, the father of my late son, to death, he was a Brazilian. He was a writer. Did Kofi tell you? He did not wait for an, she did not wait for an answer. Yes, he wrote poetry and some fiction. He was published and well-known in Brazil. He was such a Renaissance man. Printed, wrote, sang, lovely man. Anyway, I'm telling you this for a reason. He liked this martial music. He did. Strange, because he could not have been much of a military man. They tortured him, you see. The military, when he was young. He never spoke of it. But I think it affected his psyche. I think that is why he loved that music. It made him, well, eh, it made him stand to. She laughed and clapped her hands. And then as if she was suddenly uncertain whether Keisha understood, she added, you do know what I mean, right? I think she does, Kofi said impatiently. So these songs remind me of him. Are you shocked? She leaned, for leaned forward to look at Keisha. Keisha blushed slightly for she was sure that the woman could see the image that had formed in her head, a large bellied Brazilian with a mustache and bushy eyebrows, standing naked at attention, while martial music swirled at him, his penis jutting out in an ab absurd salute. She spoke quickly as if she had been caught. Well, looking at you, well, I'm not shocked, not really. Nice. Anyway, it worked for him. I suppose the secret to life is to know what makes us stand to. Yes? Keisha nodded. She looked at Kofi. He shrugged. The vultures are circling Kofi, she said, changing the subjects abruptly. Her voice came from far away. They can smell the rotting flesh. Some mornings I wake up and smell it too. Cancer, you know, has a certain smell. I remember it. My mother had that smell. I used to take deep breaths before going into her room and try not to breathe while I let her hug me into her, but I could not hold my breath forever and the stench would fill my body, my stomach would turn, it was horrible. I can smell it when I wake in the morning now. I know everyone smells it, they are gathering, suddenly they all love me. Aunt Josephine, them have a long wait, man, Kofi said, leaning forward to touch her hand. They are circling. I'm telling you, it coming like even the people in the area know them coming up into the fish farm to thief had to kill one of them the other day. She stopped for effect. What? Kofi asked. She turned to look at him. She looked very distraught. What you mean? Shot him. The fool come out in broad daylight and instead of just take the fish, the boy start to shoot at us. Where were you? right out there inspecting, you know, me and Mr. Marshall. So Mr. Marshall says, I'm going to shot him. And I say, no, Marshall. Then the boy fired again, so he shot him. She looked out again, just a boy dead on the spot over fish. He was shooting at you, Kofi walked to her and touched her shoulder. Nice looking boy, dead over fish. She shook her head, blood on the hands. The boys, Kofi was confused. No, me, my hands. She held up her hands, her palm facing out. Her fingers were yellow and spotted brown. But Marshall shot him. Marshall. Marshall shot him because he knew I wanted it. I wanted the boy dead. I was scared. This is not good, Kofi said. The mother used to pick coffee for me, you know. She told me he was worthless. His mother said to me after I killed her son, she said it like that made it right what I did. I don't understand that. They're circling. They can smell it. The decay, she said. You smell it, Keisha? She kept staring out the window. No, ma'am. I don't smell it at all. OK, I think I should stop there. Thank you.
Thanks. Thank you. Now, apparently, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions, but do, do not feel compelled to ask anything. I mean, that'll be all right, too. But if you, if you do have questions, I'll be happy to answer them and, and, uh, and so on. All right. No? OK, good. Oh, yeah. Yes. What's that? Yeah, kind of. I lived, I lived in the same neighborhood as his best friend, Skill Cole. And Skill, Skill Cole was a football, a soccer player. And frankly, we were more interested in Skill Cole than we were in Bob Marley. Um, and Skill used to have these pickup soccer games in his yard, which was about, wait, really, about three or four houses down from me. So I used to go and hang out there. And, and so that's how I, I saw Bob Marley as a, as a living person playing soccer. Um, I didn't think much of, much of it. I mean, it was just the short man playing soccer with the great skill Cole, like God himself. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, so you, you, you saw them. I mean, it, I, I lived in areas where you, you would see many of the reggae artists, yeah. But we weren't pals or anything like that. I mean, I just, he was just a guy, another Rasta man playing soccer, yeah. Any other questions? I can barely see you, so you have to sort of wave if you do have your hand up. OK, good. Well, listen, thank you all for, for, for coming. And, um, and, and thanks, everybody, for, for this opportunity. OK? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.